But what you can do, especially if you've pre-trained this a little bit with attention span, with concentration, the meditation mastery retreat and so forth, if you've applied these things, it becomes easier and easier to just kind of rein yourself in. So this is a positive form of self-control, okay? So it's not control in the negative sense. It's actually a type of surrender, which I'll get to in a little bit. But you're surrendering to your focus, if you will. That that's all that there's left for you right now. So all you do is you enter a state of focus. You replace as many thought, thoughts as you can with focusing. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for premeditating, setting the space, good vibes. A couple exercises I'd like to share today with you. First off, a very basic reminder. You guys have heard me share this several times before, especially if you've watched the Shambhala sessions. But see if you can find the threshold between when your imagination or your consciousness, which they're really quite synonymous, except you could say, okay, imagination is consciousness plus is creative power. Or you could say imagination is awareness plus consciousness, plus that capacity to perceive, to project, to imagine, to experience. But if you observe that even our experience of what we call the physical, let's say you've had a very physical day, maybe you've done some physical labor, maybe you've been on your computer all day, you've been interacting with people, uh, walking your dog, uh, you know, everything you do. And you feel kind of like inundated with the sense of physicality, the sense of heaviness, the sense of mundane, quote unquote, ordinary, which of course it isn't, but heavy, dense life. Now, if you kind of rewind, if you, if you go back through your day, if you go back through the past few hours and you scan what your experience actually consisted of, you will find that you were consistently imagining your experience. So, but there is a threshold, in a sense, you could say. There is a barrier, a threshold between when imagination feels, quote unquote, physical and externalized versus when we could say it feels like it's subjective and it's at the subtler level of imagination. And I'd like you to find that threshold for a moment. So take the past hour of your, maybe before you joined the Zoom call and before you start meditating, and just go rewind through some of your physical experiences where you were observing through the five senses, you were seeing the world, the tangible physical world. And see if, if you can rewind it, if you can go back to that moment when you thought you were experiencing AKA physical reality, the external world. But if you can actually zoom in, if you can actually go to your direct experience in that memory and kind of zoom in on what was I actually experiencing, you will see that you were in the realm of imagination. I just kind of want this to land first. So see that even what you call being physically focused, being aware of the world through your five senses, see that if you back up a little bit, if you go a little bit closer to what your actual experience consists of, you will see that you're actually imagining. Because you cannot really say that you experience something really physical, like an actual object. You can only say that you experience your imagination of that object. You were thinking about the object. You were thinking about what your senses were feeling. You were imagining it. You were imagining the sensations, which is another word of saying you were placing your focus on the apparent 
perception of, or you were placing your attention on the reference point of, you were referencing something, you were imagining something, you were creating something, you were perceiving something. All of these are just synonyms from a different angle, from a different vantage point. From the one side, you can say, okay, it's the manifestation and you're the experiencer of the manifestation. But all that's happening is still just experiencing, which you could call imagination. Now, if you kind of get that sense or get that principle, then you can find the threshold or find the shift between feeling like you're externally focused, AKA I'm aware of the world through my bodily senses. And if you kind of withdraw that attention or up that imagination, more subjective, pull it more inwards, if you will, or up level it to a subtler domain, you will see that the faculty of experiencing isn't actually changing. Consciousness isn't actually suddenly non-physical whereas before it would be physical. All that's happening is that your, pop out this chat one sec. All that's happening is that your consciousness is shifting from a, you could say 3D type of imagination to a subtler, more dreamlike, more what we would call imaginative type of imagineering or imagination. And remember that the imagination produces what you call physical reality, which is another mode of operating in your imagination. So you could say subtler imagination produces more physical imagination, denser imagination. So play around. You don't have to fully get this right now, but play around during your day-to-day -day life. And one way to notice is when you're feeling heavy, when you're feeling heavier, when you feel more like plugged into the matrix, when you feel more like you're a victim of your environment, when you feel more like you had a heavy day or you had a dense day or like things are real and you're kind of stuck and there's no options or possibilities or not a lot. You don't really feel free or exuberant or like filled with possibilities or filled with the sight of the creator. So when you have a heavier day, go back, kind of review that day from the moment you woke up just briefly and see how you were not kind of withdrawing your power of imagination or your power of consciousness, you weren't withdrawing it towards the subjective realm. You were objectifying the whole time, but it's the same power. It's the same power externalized versus keeping it more subjective, keeping it more dreamlike, keeping it more imaginative as we would typically say. But again, there is no real distinction. If you follow the threat from subtle to dense, from subjective to objective, that which moves between those two is the same field it's the same consciousness it's the same imagination so it's just a, it's just a, a verbal distinction that we're making between what seems to be physically out there as real versus what seems to be imagined but really it's the same power this is also why constantly as we are reflecting as we are externalizing our awareness or consciousness believing we're experiencing a physical world then our literally our imagination is now filled with what? With the level of imagination of what's already produced and what's already assumed, assumed to exist. That's why you feel like you had a heavy day or you feel like you weren't completely free today. Or maybe like you only have a limited number of options or feelings or possibilities. Whereas if you have a more dreamlike day, and we've all had those where you're just kind of floating doesn't mean you can't be grounded, but at the same time, you kind of feel free. You feel elevated within yourself. You feel unburdened. If you review that day, you will see that the same power of consciousness was less concerned with things outside of itself. Therefore, its power remained more subjective. It remained more with the self, closer to self, less externalized. Same power, same field, same essence, same energy, same consciousness, but a different density a different denseness does this make sense bottom line is you're always imagining if you're having an experience whether you're having a physical experience or you're having a dreamlike experience that doesn't involve the physical body in both states you are solely imagining you're using the same power of consciousness
And if we remember that imagination creates reality, then then it doesn't matter whether our consciousness is focused physically, quote unquote, or it's focused subjectively or subtly or causally even, or God state even, or absolute even. <laughs> it doesn't matter in terms of the laws that operate, the laws that are operational, that respond to that. So you're always affecting this law of frequency, the law of assumption, the law of vibration, and so forth, law of attraction, all, all essentially the same law, it's just different vantage points of the same description again. But if you realize that it doesn't really matter, now you can understand that you're always creating a reality, but in one state, in the objective state, it's slow. You seem to be um, a subject or a victim of something outside yourself but it appears that way inside your imagination. You're imagining that. But that's why things move slower for those that are more realistic, or as um, most people would like to call it realistic, whereas those that are more imaginative or more creative, or they have a looser connection to physical reality, they tend to be able to move more freely. They tend to be able to create more, in a sense, quickly or freely. So since it's the same power and the laws are always responding to this power, consciousness of free will, if you realize that if you withdraw your attention or imagination and you make it more subjective, you spend more time in that subjective sense of being, you will not only feel more powerful and more connected to your creation because you're not producing solid objects that you feel are real. You're not referencing the physical world too much. Again, doesn't mean you can't be relaxed and grounded and respond to what's happening through the senses. You don't have to be airy-fairy, but you can be elevated within yourself. You can maintain sort of a withdrawal of consciousness into a subjective state. And there you'll feel much freer. Things will feel much more malleable to you. It's more of that 4D, 5D way of operating versus the 3D, slower, um, more dense way of operating. So if you can find that threshold, between the objectification of imagination state versus the remaining subjective and therefore fluid and therefore in the creator's seat. Because as soon as you blurt your imagination out there through the physical senses, oop, it already seems like you're stuck, like your physical body in a physical world. So now your imagination gets dampened because of the belief that keeps being reinforced by your physical attention span. But if you suck that back in, so to speak, you up level it to a subtler level. Now you feel freer. Like, you can kind of paint your reality. Because remember, imagination creates what you experience. It can either be slow or it can be fluid. It can be dense or it can be free. It can be um, victimish or it can be empowered or creatorish. So that's the word. I don't think it is, but it doesn't matter. And so you're... It doesn't matter in terms of it does matter, but you're always in the same power. It doesn't matter. It's not the right way of saying it. It's like you cannot change what you are, basically. You cannot change what power you are using. As long as you're having an experience, you are imagining. This can either be externalized, physicalized, or it can remain more subjective, more subtle, and more fluid. And you will feel the difference. So I want you to kind of go back and forth, go back and forth in your day-to-day -day life and play with this threshold. And how will you know you've crossed the threshold back into 4D? Let's just roughly call it that instead of 3D imagining is because you feel much more certain. You feel much more powerful. You feel much more secure because suddenly it's like, oh, wait a second. I'm actually riding this horse, so to speak. Like, and I've got, I've got all the tools that I need right here. I'm riding the horse. It's not just riding me. I'm actually riding the horse. So you have that sense of, that's just one analogy, but <laughs> can say I'm driving the bus instead of I'm being driven. But it has a feeling of um, energetic, creative, I wouldn't say control, but in a sense, it feels like you have a greater measure of say in your reality. You feel free to navigate based on your intuition and free will and determine what it is that you wish to learn or that you wish to produce or that you wish to go to or that you wish to create and so forth. Versus when you externalize it, which typically happens on automatic pilot, when you're not being mindful, when you're not sort of harnessing your focus, what happens is, or what you feel is like you are at the whim of your circumstance. 
things feel much more real, much more solid. You feel like there aren't a whole lot of options available to you, so to speak. It's just the way that it is kind of state. So play with that distinction. And because it's very helpful to notice these distinctions experientially and kind of plant a flag, plant a marker when you identify the threshold experientially, when you're like, oh, this is what it feels like when I step over that threshold. And this is what it feels like when I step back over the threshold in the other direction and back and forth and back and forth. The clearer you're able to kind of ping yourself when that happens, now it's much, much less likely that you'll fall prey to an automatic state of consciousness that's externalized and that forgets that it's actually currently still imagining its reality. It's referencing its reality using the same power that imagination is, that the freedom of consciousness is, that that creative energy of awareness is. So building this marker in your system, you will be alerted more and more automatically. You will be pinged like, hey, wait a second. I feel like that again. I feel stuck in my reality. I feel like a victim or I feel like things move slowly or I feel like I don't have a lot of possibilities right now. Or I feel just kind of like low vibe. Identify that threshold and place that marker kind of where you would prefer to not go below. Don't place it too high, but definitely also don't place it too low, of course. If you place it too high, if you're too ambitious, you're going to have a bit of a rough ride, like piggybacking back and forth, like pivoting back and forth. Can be a good exercise for a while, but just move it up a little bit above what your current state of automatic behavior is. Say, okay, this is kind of the threshold of how objectified I wish to feel or make myself feel versus how much I want to be in the creator seat of that subjective state of imagination, where I'm feeling, where I'm being, where I'm aware, where I'm awake, where I'm lucid, where I'm deliberate, where I'm intentional, where I'm creating, basically. And of course, you can relax in that state as well. You don't have to always be on edge or always be on point. But place the marker somewhere where you feel comfortable setting your next baseline and then whenever you go below that, you will be pinked, which will help you to remember to take a step back. Okay, that's one. I'll let it sink in for a minute. And then there's two more aspects I want to share with you guys. And one I will do in a guided meditation. And now I'll move into the second topic, which is the whole spiritual path. If we want to summarize the approaches, if we want to keep it simple, because what I just shared is a method or way of seeing that will help you just in your everyday mastery, just becoming more aware of yourself. But at the heart of it, now I want to address more the heart of it. Like the previous thing was a bit more of a, a mental exercise, a conscious exercise. But I want to <clears throat> add the following, which is beyond all techniques, there are two main modalities that we could distinguish and summarize in this way. Two approaches of the heart, two approaches when it comes to devotion, when it comes to divinity, when it comes to your love for God, when it comes to your love for self-realization, when it comes to your God for purity of service. And that is will or focus. And you could roughly call this the masculine path or surrender. So this means that in any situation or any experience that you find yourself in, 
whether you're already flying high or whether you're kind of in a depressed state or a challenging situation or an emotionally dense, rich environment. <laughs> You can always fall back okay if you don't if you don't remember anything like any of the methods any of the techniques and nothing works for you you know um the, which is typically why it happens when you feel completely overwhelmed or like stuck it tends to be your higher self trying to guide you to kind of just like plunge into the heart like drop everything you know surrender basically but can also come through focus or will so i'll clarify these two kind of main paths of the same path. Let's take focusing. So let's say you're in an emotionally rich state, right? And I mean that kind of facetiously, when you're like an emotional wreck or like things are just like chaotic, your mind's chaotic. None of the methods you've ever heard me share kind of work in that moment. You don't know what which mantra to use and, and you're trying too hard and it's this and that. So... And you're basically what you're trying to do, if you're just in a normal state, you're kind of in a sense, for the most part, you're trying to control yourself more, right? Now, it's not a positive term, maybe, but in a sense, we are disciplining ourselves on a moment to moment basis. If you're just in sort of a normal state, your day to day state, but you are contemplating spirituality, you are maybe listening to video or audio, you are maybe meditating, but there's no real distress, there's no real blockage happening in that moment, there's no life or death kind of challenge. For the most part, what you're doing is you're gaining a little bit of mastery every day. You're gaining a little bit more mindfulness, a little bit more control or discipline over your experience, over your self-knowledge. But again, when shit hits the fan or when you're just having an afflictive state or intense emotional inner environment, then or your mind just kind of spins out and it doesn't know which technique to apply right now. You can always fall back on one of these two things. And typically surrender will be the easiest if you're in the state I just described, like the sort of chaotic, nothing works kind of state. Surrender is typically the most accessible option. But I'll start with the other one, which is focus or will. And roughly, again, you could say it's the more masculine path, if you will. So let's say your mind's going nuts. You've already cycled through a thousand different spiritual techniques and nothing seems to work or last or stick. Maybe you had like five seconds of relief, but then it disappeared. You tried the same technique and it doesn't work anymore. Try a different mantra and you all probably know these states of mind. So and what I'm about to share is not exclusive to when you're in an afflictive state. I'm just saying that's kind of when your higher self pushes you into the very heart of what spirituality is about. It pushes you, it forces you into the very core modality, the very core attitudes that spirituality comes back down to at the end of the day when all methods are pushed aside and that is simple focus simple harnessing of will harnessing of focus so when your mind goes nuts or when your emotions go nuts or your circumstances go nuts or people around you go nuts or whatever it is the world goes nuts if you, all you can do is just focus doesn't matter on what it doesn't matter on what not so much it matters a little bit but not initially it matters that you enter a state of focus that you're able to gather your will if all you can do is just remember that and say anytime and see that anytime you move out of that state of presence of focus of consciousness it hurts because you're already in a chaos you're already in a chaotic momentum you're already in a downward spiral you, you know your life outside the external imagination seems to suggest you're suggesting it but it seems to suggest that it is not going so well or it is kind of stuck or it's not actually wanted to be but you don't have the bent with to feel good about it anyway you don't have the bent with to take a leap of faith and imagine your desired reality and stay true to that but what you can do especially if you've pre-trained this a little bit with attention span with concentration the meditation mastery retreat and so forth if you've applied these things it becomes easier and easier to just kind of rein yourself in so this is a positive form of self-control okay so it's not control in the negative sense. It's actually a type of surrender, which I'll get to in a little bit. But you're surrendering to your focus, if you will. That that's all that there's left for you right now. So all you do is you enter a state of focus. You replace as many thought, thoughts as you can with focusing. As much of your thinking, if you're like 99% thinking, 
turn it into 98% thinking and 2% focus or 95% thinking and 5% focus. And even if you do it by that, by that much, if you increase how much you change the activity of thinking with the activity of focusing, of being, of being present, being focused, willing yourself to be focused, if you do it even 5% more than you did before, you're going to find massive relief. You're going to find massive uh, contrast in your state before that. And you're going to be able to reconnect to that higher self that is speaking ease and soothing energy and peace into you all the time. Does this make sense? But it's not something that we typically can do if we're not trained. So this is why concentration is a helpful exercise because it does give you much greater mastery over times when your mind is kind of out of control. If you can just let your mind run free, but you focus, not on the mind, but you just focus on focusing itself. You concentrate on being concentrated. You will find that peaceful center in the midst of the wheel spinning. And in that peaceful center, even if you can still feel out in your mind are kind of spinning, but if you can focus on that focused state, you will find that silent center. And through that silent center, you will get, um, at least after a little while, adjusting to that, you will receive new guidance naturally. You will be realigned with your higher self. You will come back into contact with the bigger perspective. Your fear will start to dissolve and so forth. And it will be replaced by this state of focus, which now starts to kind of expand. You no longer have to like be eye of the needle focused because everything around you is a shit storm. The more you focus on the eye of the needle or the eye of the storm, the kind of the wider that eye becomes. And the more over time, now you got to stay there because if you jump out too quickly, boom, the storm is going to close back in on you because there's still momentum. So you kind of have to stay in the eye of the storm and follow it around or let it follow you around until the storm, the hurricane dissipates. But you will find in that intermediary process that as the storm of your afflictive states, um, they're kind of almost like pushed away. They're almost like dissipated like clouds or the um, condensation on the grass in the morning, the dew that's just being evaporated by the sun. It's kind of that feeling. If you just stay focused long enough for even 5% of the time, but more and more and more and more, then it's like this eye of the center, this silence, this centeredness, this sense of power, consciousness itself, knowing itself, begins to expand. And you can kind of like relax a little bit. Now it becomes simultaneously easier to maintain that focus, but it also, there's less need to maintain the focus in a, in a concentrated way. You can now kind of relax without losing that sense of centeredness. That's the storm, the eye of the needle kind of, or the eye of the storm kind of expanding. And ultimately the storm will dissipate. And all there is, is again, that empty space of your naked state of awareness. So that would be one main approach when shit hits the fan, you don't know what to do. So don't see this as a technique. See this as like a core foundational attitude. It's basically the same as surrender, which again, I'll get to in a little bit. That's the beauty of this. But it's a way of surrendering because you have nothing else to reach into. The moment you reach a hand out into the storm, it gets shredded. So the only safe space that you have in that moment is the eye of the storm. It's just boom, back to presence. Boom, back to presence. It's not a technique. It's an attitude. It's using yourself. It's being aware. You see, it's not really a technique or method. It's you simply being aware, like focused, harnessing your will instead of letting it get destroyed in whatever is happening. All right, taking a break from that. Take a deep breath. And we're going to apply that right now for a minute. So take a deep breath again and relax your body. Relax your mind. And all you do is simply focus, that's all. Just bring your consciousness back. If you wanna choose a point in your body, you can to start with, it might make it more tangible and easier. Ultimately, focus doesn't have a location. 
consciousness doesn't have a location, but it doesn't matter too much. You can pick a location. You can pick the third eye or you can pick the heart or just the central column, the central alignment that kind of aligns with your nervous system. But a sense of the eye of the storm, the here and now of your own center. And all you do is just focus. Pretend that if you don't focus, you're going to hurt. You're going to suffer. You're going to cause pain to yourself. So you've got great incentive to just focus. Even if you're not good at concentration, doesn't matter. Just for a moment, just focus. Be aware or imagine even the state of being focused. What would it be like? You can conjure it up through imagination too, you see. What would it be like? What would it feel like? What would it look like? If you saw yourself in like a state of the Buddha, like a state of a Buddha statue, just like boom, focused. Feel what that would feel like for a moment. Where there's no movement. Where all movement, if there is movement, the movement is ignored. And you are simply aware of being focused. That's all. Just aware of being, basically. And it needs a little bit of elevation. You need to elevate your will a little bit to do that. You need to elevate your focus a little bit. You need to conjure up that extra bit of will, that extra bit of desire, that extra bit of power. That's why I say it's a bit more of the masculine. So conjure up that will and create a little gap in your thinking process and just be focused. And the focus itself is silent. Now, stuff might be going on, but the focus itself, the state of focus it's, is like a silence. It's like a no thought. Focus is no thought. Focus itself. Now, you can focus on a thought, but focus itself, being focused, is basically a thought-free window. See if you can tap into this experientially. For those who are able to, and you all are, you just might not think you are, but radically stop thinking all at once. That's another way to train quickly, train your free will to become more powerful, more unified, more disciplined, more in charge of itself. Is radically, immediately, just stop all thinking, see that there's no use for you right now to think about anything. Boom. Dispel all thoughts. I focus, focus on focus, focus on focus, focus on focus, focus only on being focused, focus only on being focused right now, gather all your will, focus only on being focused, no thoughts, only focus, be aware of your focus, be aware of being focused, be aware of being focused, be aware of being focused. If you can keep bringing yourself back to that, and again, if your entire environment is in pain, experientially, you have great incentive. Otherwise, you would never do this, right? If it's sunshine and da da da, everything is, is beautiful. You would never like go sit down and be like, okay, no thought, no thought, no thought. You'd be way too busy enjoying yourself, which is great. But so again, this is what you fall back on when shit hits the fan. And it's a, it's a core modality. It's not a method. It's a core attitude of honoring the creator, remembering that you are God that there is no need for thought, that you don't have to go out. You can just, boom, focus. That's the core attitude of gathering your will. The other main thing that never fails is surrender. Just give it all up. Because the only reason you get shredded by the storm is because you want to reach for something in the storm. True or not? So now this could be anything. You could not even know what you're reaching for. You know, it might be an object. It might be a manifestation. It might be a person. It might be a particular experience. But oftentimes we don't even know what we're attached to or what we're grasping for. That's causing us to be so engaged in the turmoil or in the peace because sometimes things go really well and it's peaceful and it's just a light breeze that day. There's no storm happening. It's possible too, but, um, 
but some, but it becomes more highlighted when there is a storm going on, when everything is highlighted, when you do feel your pain like 10 times as much every second, then it's an opportunity to, to just relinquish everything all at once, to give it all back to the creator, to just surrender. And you will see it's not that different from focusing. Because when you surrender everything, what you're left with is focus. And when you're focusing, what you're left with is surrender, if you do it long enough. So they're, the masculine and the feminine, they really are a unity in that way. Will and surrender or faith. And it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman in this regard. You, I would say you train both of them and see which one works best for you and go mostly that route. But train both of them and see how they unify. You might start out in a shit storm. You might pick the route of surrender, but you'll find as you keep surrendering, keep surrendering, just give it up, give it up, give it up. Trust in God, give it up, give it away. It's not yours. It's not yours. Surrender all of it. Trust, faith. You will find after doing that for a while, that core attitude, again, it's not a method. It's going back to the essential beingness of what you've been given, which is your freedom to be. You're giving up your delusions. It's not a method. It's a core essential attitude. It's very close to God. It's the way of knowing God directly. If you keep surrendering for short moments, many times, short moments, many times, short moments, or one wild moment all at once, you know, it can differ depending on your situation, what you've trained. You will find that after a while, the storm kind of seems to settle or not affect you. And what is in its place is a sense of clarity and focus and sort of naked spacious awareness and a sense of being one with the creator, basically a state of open focus. And vice versa, if you keep repeating, boom, not getting lost in thoughts, not indul indulging in your desires for thinking and for figuring things out and to control things, but you just focus, 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 focus. <sighs> you start to feel the sigh of relief. You start to feel the surrender, the relaxation. And so they come back together at the top, at the third eye and then upwards to the crown where you make contact with that, where I am God, where God is I am, where I am and God are indistinguishable. That's where the bliss is, my friends. But focus and surrender are both great precursors for bliss. For And when I say bliss, I don't just mean like excitement. I mean, it's like a combination of profound love, relief, liber or liberation, clarity or knowingness without knowing anything. It's a knowingness without any knowledge. It's a certainty without any promise. And that freedom where you know God is a combination of love, peace, and joy. Perfection, feeling a completion, a wholeness, an indestructibility, power, true power, the source of power that you seek in everything else that you're doing. Seek to be fully reconnected to, fully plugged back into. So when things get too busy, you don't know what to do, you don't know where to go, you don't know what is what, surrender and or focus. And you can combine them immediately after some practice, you can recognize both and bring them in, but it doesn't really matter. You can pick one or the other, it's the same.
who's ever had that? Raise your hand. If you've been in sort of a shit storm and you had just this breaking point, whether or not it seemed to be forced or voluntarily on your part, it's really ultimately the same game. But who's had the moment where suddenly there was a moment of surrender or a few moments of surrender. And within a few minutes, if not sooner, you felt like total peace and bliss. Raise your hand. Just curious. Cool. So that's that. So why don't we do that more often, huh? Why don't we do that on an ordinary day when you go into your job or whatever? Why, why does it have to get so bad for us to appreciate the God-given existence of being here and now and surrendering to our hearts, to our innate freedom? So let's marinate a little bit in God consciousness. And um, I'll be radiating it. For those who are unfamiliar with it, you can tune in and see if you can pick up on it. It can, it can transfer through video for your knowledge. All right, ready? And of course, everyone participate, like radiate yourself. It's just not a one-man job, but you can use me as a radiator if you want. See if you can find deep in the background of your I am. -ness. It's not really in the background, but that's kind of what it typically feels like, what it gives you access to. So from the background of your consciousness, your I am. -ness, see if you can find that place or point, that meeting point, back and up, whoop, or just up or just back, whatever works for you. That's the general sort of metaphysical symbolized direction is backwards or upward. Again, it's just a euphemism, it's just a symbol, but it will do, it will work. So focus upwards and see if you can find this space, metaphysically speaking, this point, metaphysically speaking, symbolically speaking, where in the depths in the interior of your sense of I exist, your sense of individuated I exists, begins to know, begins to peer beyond its own point of being. And it begins to make contact with the knowingness that I am God and God is I. I and my father are one. My father is greater than I, yet I and my father are one. See if you can find this point, so to speak, where I am equals I am God. And when you do, you will never fully see life the same way again, even if struggle returns, even if the veil returns. If there's only one and experience of I exist is real to me, that means that very real experience that I exist must be the creator, must be the one. It must be. If all there is, is the one. And there is also apparently very real, my sense of I exist, then that I exist must be the one. Somehow, don't try to figure this out. Just know it. Just surrender it. Surrender to this knowingness beyond all knowledge, beyond the mind. And try it from the heart 
or from the crown. If you want to use location, try it from either the heart center or from the crown or above the crown. It's much more helpful than to try it from sort of the brain location or the mind location. So either drop into your heart and know that the I amness that you feel in the depths of your heart somehow is God, is the father, is the mother, is source. Or shoot up through the crown and kind of imagine or sense or know this cosmic meeting point between the individuated self and the God, the cosmic God consciousness self. And just know, you don't have to have visions or anything per se, just know that somehow, just have faith, just know that somehow I am equals, not comes close to, is God. It must be that way. Just know that it must be that way and you will begin to experience it. You will begin to intuit it. God is bliss. God is joy. God is freedom. God is certainty without knowledge. God is faith. God is. You are. Enough said. Now be it. Have faith in it. Surrender to the great I am. This background of yourself, which has never throughout any of your experiences changed, even an iota. It's never gone anywhere. It's never left you. This changeless essence of self, I am equals God. Rest in that certainty, in that mystery. It's a certain mystery or a mysterious certainty. It cannot fully be known and yet it cannot be denied. It is that clear. It's beyond the polarities, the dualities, the swirling energies of planet Earth right now, as it spins and spins and spins, both out of control as well as into harmony. This is beyond that. This is not just its center point. It's also all around it. It's all encompassing. It's all forgiving. It's all inclusive. It even ex includes exclusivity. That's how all-inclusive it is. It even includes judgment. That's how non-judgmental it is. It includes illusion. That's how real it is, how indestructible. In the depths of your being right now, I am somehow with great certainty, know that I am as God. God is you. And allow in some of that joy, you know? Like, don't, don't hold it off. It's not a serious business at the end of the day. God's not serious. It's joy. Allow yourself to enjoy the depths of the I am, knowing more and more every day how that I am equals God. And you will gain greater conviction in this with every attempt. It's 
Sometimes it feels muddy, sometimes it feels easy and clear, but if you practice daily, your conviction will increase, will rise, and your actual experiential sense of unity, oneness with all that is, will increase, will become more vivid, will become more lived, more real, more activated. And all the beautiful qualities and insights and clarity and intuitiveness and in, yeah, all these insights that you read about and hear about and maybe sometimes have, they will naturally be integrated. They will naturally be available to you more and more. The closer you know, the closer you come to the total conviction that I am God, God is I am. The clearer the mind-body-spirit complex becomes, the more it becomes a vessel of this truth. Because whatever you truly assume at the deepest level of your being will become manifest. You become a God man or God woman. And I don't mean that in any kind of grandiose way. You already are God man, God woman. What else? You really think your mom created you? <laughs> she gave you a body. She did not create you, my friends. You and the creator are tight. Like this indivisible. Your consciousness, your I amness is God. God expressed, God manifested, activated. God plus free will, a point of free will is you. But ultimately, you are that God. You are the giver of yourself. You are the enabler of your point of free will, ultimately. And yes, you also are the shepherd of your point of free will your point of creation, creativity, of decision, of determination, of surrender. You are the dancer and the dance floor. You are the atom and the space. But rest in that place beyond dualities, beyond polarities, and surrender your body, your mind, your heart, your spirit to that knowingness a little bit more every day. Don't beat up on yourself. Just a little bit more every day. Sometimes there'll be a lot more. Sometimes there'll be well, maybe a little step back, but on the whole, you'll make great progress. A little bit more every day. I am God. My father and I are one. Paraphrasing J. Christ. I am is God. What marvelous news to remind ourselves of. All right, now for the other guided meditation, and this is perfect space to jump off from, knowing that I am God, beyond the polarities, beyond dualities, beyond third, fourth, fifth density, that place of unity of sixth density and beyond, where it's beyond this or that, beyond good and bad, beyond light and dark. It's unified. It's all the light. Now, what if from this state, you were completely clean, clear, no memory, no background, no past to continue to reference? And remember, the past is your present imagination, but it seems so real. We've given so much power away to the idea, the illusion inside of our present imagination, the illusion of everything we have experienced. We're kind of heavily loaded with our imagination reminding us of our memories. It has created a certain momentum, a certain pattern of expectation, of assumption, of belief. So we feel like we don't have a complete clear slate. And we don't typically realize how deep this goes in terms of the program. So just take a moment 
to clear all that, to come back to this present empty space of naked consciousness or naked, naked imagination, imagination not yet filled with any particular reference point or decision, just the pure capacity, the pure potential of imagining whatever it is you wish to imagine, whatever it is you wish to give shape to, whatever it is you wish to assume is true. But don't assume anything is true just yet. Stay kind of as the I am God beyond imagination, beyond active imagination. Just that state of conscious awareness. And in this conscious awareness, notice how there is no actual past determining anything for you. You would have to step down your vibration, your focus, and lose it in some kind of an idea that you're imagining that you call the reality of the past or the reality of the present or the reality of the future. But notice how if you don't step down your consciousness to that assumption, it is simply empty. It is simply present. It is here and now. It is wide open, naked awareness. It is naked in. That is your true essence, unconditioned awareness. Unconditional consciousness is always here. The I am before you add anything to it, just I am. It's formless, free of location. It's even free of your present incarnation. You have to actually imagine and remember that you're physically incarnate to conjure that life back up. If your concentration is deep enough in the I am is God, you can actually experience yourself as not incarnate at all, as not in any particular lifetime at all, just as God. This can never fully be veiled from any entity, even under the veil. It is your birthright. It is your free will to determine whether or not you wish to remember this. But just do this as best as you can for now. A clear, naked awareness. This is our starting point. This is our blank canvas right now. This is our empty space. This is God before anything is produced or given or enabled. Before the Son of God came in to play. Just God, just the original enabler of all possibilities. This original, primordial, naked, natural, innately free God consciousness has no obligations. I want you to feel that for a moment. This consciousness has no obligations. It has no karma. It has no patterns. You got to understand this. You as God has no obligations, has no constrictions, has no, you should be doing this. You should be doing that. You should become this person. You should become that person. This is who you are because of this and that happening. You don't have any of those responsibilities yet until you assume them. Now, to some degree, yeah, that's part of the play if we want to amuse ourselves in that way. And so we can do that, but let's do it in a powerful way. And this is why this meditation is happening. So again, I know I'm saying a lot, but I hope what it's transmitting is actually deeper silence, deeper anchoring. So don't focus too much on my every word. Just kind of let the stream guide you. That's more important. But sometimes using more words and using them faster can actually kind of settle you into that state better. If you're not like trying to understand or follow every word, just kind of receive the ongoing stream of pointers that are happening right now. So right now, the naked awareness of God before any responsibility, before any choice, before any man came into the picture, before any memory of a lifetime, just you, I am. Now from this pure potential, this pure, sheer, naked, free power, Free yourself of all memory. All the memory of this lifetime. So kind of go into the incarnation, so to speak, that you know today. But see if you can remove for a moment all memory. At least any reality you give to them. At the most, there are empty images that don't imply anything, that don't instruct anything. Let your memory lose all instruction. It has no instruction. It doesn't inform you about who you are. It doesn't inform you about what's real. 
It doesn't inform you about what's possible. Not anymore. That was an assumption. That was an illusion inside of your imagination. Inside of your capacity to choose, that was an illusion you gave your power to. You froze your free will into the illusion, the automatic sense perception that you are a certain way because of this and this and this and this and this and this and this sequence of events and experiences and sensations and thoughts and people and occurrences and so forth. None of that is absolutely real. It is optionally real. It's valid, but it's only valid because you choose to give it validity. There's nothing wrong with it, but you don't have to. It's not an obligation. It is a free choice. Every moment is a clear slate like this and a free choice. And give yourself permission to surrender all your memory back to God, back to the original state. Let it be reabsorbed into the empty space. Let it turn to the empty space. Let it turn into empty space. Let the vase, let the pot, encapsulating the space around yourself, let it break and merge with the sky, with the space around the pot. Now, if you could contact your true soul, which is kind of in between the gods and your incarnation, it's closer to the God state than to the incarnation, but nevertheless, it's kind of in between. If you can contact your God essence, sorry, your soul essence, what is your unique, unique desire, your unique makeup? What is your personality like on a soul level, not a physical level? It might be vastly different. Typically, there are some resemblances because you carry a lot of those inclinations, but it depends on how much you've conditioned yourself with the contents of this physical incarnation. But you have a spark-like, free, spontaneous personality as a soul, as the initial spark of God, as the initial individuation, the initial assignment, the initial free will from God. And what's that like in your case? And what if you didn't have this incarnation yet? No data, just that spontaneous, spark-like, humorous. You'd be surprised how humorous souls are. Sense of humor is absolutely universal. Tap into that playfulness, that lightness, that freedom, that desire for love, that compassion for all beings. It's always something along those lines. There's not a negative quality in your soul. It doesn't exist. Anything negative swirling around right now is other human beings in the form of your own mind internalized through repeated imaginative experiences. It's not real, not your responsibility, it's a choice. You are free. You could be that spontaneous, loving, playful, purely positive self right now. You could fill the blank canvas of this incarnation because the body is not telling you who you are either. You just have to re-imprint upon the body your true soul personality, your true spark. And it will take on that shape. It will heal accordingly. It will express and become radiant and crystalline accordingly. You got to let go of 3D. You got to let go of what people have taught you. Who else taught you anything? People. People, 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 people. Who taught the people? More people. Who taught them? More people. Since when are people any reliable source of authority for you to imprint yourself in accordance with? What folly. And then we give that so much credit. We give that so much authority. And we build this tiny little box around ourselves. And we make sure nobody exits that box. artists <laughs> there are always oh, an artist
don't, what about you is not made by people. The part untouched by anything humans have ever instructed you or suggested to you, that's you. Anything that carries any iota ever attributable to any human that you've met in your lifetime is severely not you. Is precisely not you. So don't defend it. Don't feel like you're responsible for it. Don't feel like you have to oblige. It's just people. People, 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 teaching people, 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 teaching people, people, people. And we all know people don't know that much. And what they do know is typically filled with negativity and lack beliefs and unworthiness. And we keep reimprinting each other like this. And you can break this spell. You cannot change your past in that sense. You can change your past, by the way. But in a sense, you could say, okay, what happened happened. What you've been exposed to, you've been exposed to. You can change this. But for this exercise, let's say that you couldn't. But you can. But let's say that you couldn't. Even then. It's only real for you now if you continue to give it authority, if you give it reality, if you give it meaning and credit, and as if it carries any kind of instruction. It doesn't. It carries options to choose from, but that's it. Nothing a human being ever told you was instructive. Everyone's trying to copy themselves onto the planet. Same here, but I think my vibe is pretty good overall, so I think it would benefit people. But we all try to copy each other, ourselves onto each other. And if that's in alignment, and if that's coming from true love and from the true spark of the soul, it's a wonderful tool. You could say then you're each other's spiritual teachers, but that's different. Just the matrix minds trying to print upon each other, you don't want that. I don't think it's not you. So why buy into it? Start fresh, erase all your memory and decide from the zero point, decide from this timeless nonlinear space of the soul's personality, which remember it's playful, it's humorous, it's filled with joy to the brim. It wants to share, it wants to express, it wants to radiate. It's compassionate. It recognizes the oneness in all things. It has a sense of God and divinity and sacredness and everything. Innocence, joy, bliss, peace, radiance, expansion, expression. That's who. Only that is you. Nothing else is you. If you get this, you're free. Your chakra is open. Your throat ch chakra opens. Your third eye begins to open. You start to see all these patterns. Boom, zoop. Understanding dawns. Intuition becomes... Superb. And then zoop. I'm summarizing, but I am equals God. God is everything. And then you start radiating like a sun. Literally, it feels like you are the sun. It's very close to that. And Ra sometimes calls God the great central sun. At the end of all creations, everything comes back together into the great central sun. And other channeled materials have use the same terminology, the great description. It's almost like you are an all-encompassing sun. That's what it feels like. So that's where the soul, that spark, that playful, joyful, sharer, expressor, compassionate being, that wise, holistic, purely positively oriented entity matches or meets with God. That's the meeting point is where it becomes one with that sun. Satchitananda. You are God on earth in a form. How fucking marvelous. What a precious opportunity. Now, who are you? Be only who you are. Don't go by memory. Because memory consists of humans. Memory is nothing but suggestions made by other humans, for the most part. Not all. I mean, you spend beautiful times in nature and so forth. But for the most part, what you memorize has to do with humans, no? So let that go. Nothing wrong with humans. But also, they're not the smartest creatures in the universe yet. They're trying. 
but don't let memory instruct your now. Have you, from God and from soul level, instruct your now, and that will affect your past and your future, and you will start to see the optimal timelines and so forth. You will start to feel it. You'll begin to see multiple parallel timelines of yourself, and they can start to cross-communicate, and you say, oh, hey, this is more beneficial, this is less beneficial, but it's all by choice. The less baggage you carry, the less memory you attribute instructive power to, authority to, the less you do that, the more free you are to actually sense who you are and what's the best inspiration for you in this moment and in this moment and in this moment. It'll be unclouded. It'll be fearless. It'll be joyful. And most likely, your desires will transmute more and more maybe instantly in some cases, from protecting a self-based bubble to service to others. You see that all that matters while you are here is that radiance, it's that playfulness. It's making a difference in the whole. That's why you came. You're already joyful. You're already safe. You're already secure. You don't need that from anyone else. You don't need that from the world, from your house, from your finances. You really don't. Doesn't mean you won't attract these things. The more you are the vibration of security and safety, the more you will attract these things because it's just vibrational energy and law and reflection. What do you assume will, stay, will take form? But more important than all that is the heart of why you're here. And that's up to you to imprint right now onto the present. Don't let the past imprint upon the present. The present is always a clear canvas. It's always free of obligation. It's always free of past tendencies. Unless you imagine past tendencies and give them authoritative, instructive, illusory power. You're the greatest power in your world. And you're here with purpose. You're here with great joy. You're here with great intention, powerful intention powerful intention and you're never going to be fully fulfilled until you instruct your present from that soul intention and you don't take shit from no one it's like the perfect combination of love them but fuck them like don't give it credit but love them. And that's the only way you can love them is if you don't take instructive credit from other people's thoughts. You can learn. You can reflect each other. Of course, you can learn all the time. By all means, learn all the time. But don't let any human being, don't let any human thought from the past, any conditioning that's imprinted, don't let any of that clout your vision of what you really are. Don't believe it. If you don't believe it, it doesn't become real. It doesn't hinder you from what you really wish to choose and be and radiate. So when you make choices, come from God, come from who you really are. And then you'll see your choices are obvious. They're just staring you in the face. They're so clear and bright and here in your face. There's no, there's no real choice process when you're clear. You only have choices when you're not clear. <laughs> it's the paradox. You have total free will. And yet you want what you want at a true level. And you don't want anything else that you might think you want based on a, a weird, vague collection of human perspective. You might think you want this and this and this and this. But when you come from the soul, from a clear slate, no past attributed to yourself. There's total free will, and yet there's nothing to choose between, you see? Because you are what you are, and, you, and every option that falls into your lap that is a clear representation of that, it just knows itself, it recognizes itself. It's the spark of God recognizing the spark of God, and it's just in alignment. So there will be fewer and fewer moments in your life where you're bogged down with multiple options to choose from. Hmm. What about this? What about that? What about this? Now, don't get me wrong. There's infinite possibilities. So it's a paradox. It's not mutually exclusive. It's a paradox. 
there are infinite possibilities, infinite options for you to choose. However, when you come from that connection, when you're under the influence of source, as Abraham says, instead of under the influence of something else, usually a human perspective. But if you're under the influence of source, you know it because you're joyful, you're playful, you're humorous, you're bright, you're exuberant, you feel happy, you feel like everything is possible at some level, even if your mind doesn't quite believe it yet, but you feel it, you know it. And then you will naturally be gravitated towards the highest choice in your life. And then only fear can come in and make you kind of feel like you have to choose this or that or this or figure this out. But really, you don't have a choice. That is free will. <laughs> you know you're in contact with your free, true free will when you realize you don't really have a choice. There's only one option at any moment, and it's the brightest. It's the truest. Does this make sense, this paradox? So I'm not trying to say you don't have free will. Do you get that? I'm saying you, when you are connected to your free will, you're not scattered. Life becomes beautifully simple, beautifully direct, beautifully exuberant. When you feel clouded, you're under the influence of memory, not the clear slate of the eternal present where I am equals God. And I'm this joyful, exuberant, compassionate spark of the creator that came here with clear intention. When you're aligned to that love, that intention, that frequency of your true self, there's always only one option, really. And it doesn't even feel like an option. It just feels like your life. It just feels like the guidance. It just feels like the next most obvious elevation or step or body movement or mind movement or typing a, a letter or an email or making a decision or whatever it looks like. You're not even distracted by what your activities are. You just, it just kind of comes out of you because you know this is boom. Only memory can interfere with that lifetime, with that path, with your service, with your intention for being here. Memory is the veil. Remembrance is the end of memory influencing you. So remember, but don't memorize. So then who are you now? Just be that. No obligation to any past image. Who are you now? So you see, you can only surrender to yourself. Anytime you surrender, you gain more of yourself and you lose more memory. At least the instructive illusion that memory seems to carry, which it doesn't. 